what up, guys? Welcome to vlog 12. For fuck's sake. It's a feel good. Welcome, guys, to podcast 12. If I can actually get it right for once. Because I just literally just now got it wrong. I was like, welcome to vlog 12. But it's not, it's podcast 12. Episode 12 of the podcast. Yeah, this is the only place you will find it. So stay tuned. Um, we've got a long podcast planned for you today. It's all about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. Jimmy Iovine, the guy behind Interscope. Dr. Dre, well, legend in the rap game in producing. Uh, the guy behind Aftermath Records. Um, if you've heard of NWA, if you've heard of Snoop Dogg, if you've heard of Eminem, he's worked with them all. And I've got a podcast all about that. They, there was a series called The Defiant Ones on Netflix that this podcast is all about, and I'm going to be talking about that. So if you haven't seen it, that's great. If you've seen it, you, you probably get it even more. Um, it's just painting a picture of what it was. And me giving you my opinion, really. Um, can't wait for this. I mean, I've been working on this for a while. I've seen, I actually watched the whole series again just to get an, a better take on it, clearer picture. I mean, podcasters do do this from time to time, but they'll see a documentary and then review it. Recently, True Geordie did one on the Madeleine McCann documentary that was on Netflix and he talked about it. He did the same with the Michael Jackson documentary. I'm not going to go into that, but yeah. So, this is just about what I saw, my take on it. Uh, a cover, like I'm covering the whole thing briefly anyway well, it's gonna, we're going to be here a while basically so yeah let's jump right into it <laughs> oh god so yeah it was um, it was interesting watching this and it opened up my eyes to what, what goes on in the, in the industry the music industry and it's just when you pursue what you love and what was a passion from a young age both of these guys did that and of course they had bumps along the way times where they might not have made it but they did in the end that's what matters and through the adversity it made them stronger and I'll talk about those sort of things as we get on but yeah just a little introduction to both of them so yeah Dr Dre rap legend known for being part of the rap group NWA featuring Ice Cube, Easy E the DOC many more. Um, now, if I get if some of this might go over your heads, if you're not into your hip hop or your rock or whatever I talk about, it's a mix of the bo of both. And what this series done well is it covered both. It jumped between Dre's story and Jimmy's story until both their stories became one, if you like, until they met and worked together. That's what it's about. And so yeah, he's a producer. He's the guy behind the record label Aftermath Entertainment, former co-owner of Death Row Records. Forgot about that. <laughs> um, he produced music for the likes of Snoop Dogg, Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, guys. And, of course, he's a co-founder of Beats Electronics, Dre Beats. So that's Dr. Dre. A little bit into what, what, what you might know him for. So then Jimmy Iovine is the co-founder of Interscope Records. He's the co-founder of Beats Electronics. James Iovine was born in 1953 in New York. His father was the son of Italian immigrants and like his dad he was most likely to be a dock worker, nothing special, just a normal life for the son of an immigrant. And then we move on to Dr. Dre. He is a bit younger. Andre Young was born in 1965 in Compton, California. He was a quiet kid and it, he, you know, he always had that pass passion for music from a young age. His mum said, despite a difficult upbringing, like single mum, you know, different stepfathers over the years, this probably made him quiet as well, but his love for music was always there and she always explained this, like he'd be three or four and, and like listening to music and looking around for the notes and like really appreciating it from a young age. Um, he started out as a DJ in the local club, 
This is where he met the world class re- wrecking crew. They were like they were big in the eighties, basically. And that era, and it was at a local like youth club, where they were DJs, basically. But they did have a few albums. He had a few albums with them. I'll get into that later on. But there's so many great talents in the indus- this kind of industry that come from adversity and fight for it and do well. It's I, I don't know what it is. Like even with footballers, the ones that were poorer and had less end up being more successful. I don't know. When you come from a place of privilege, what more are you working for in your life? Do you know what I mean? What what's there to achieve? You've really got if you're born into money and stuff. Silver spoon, if you like. Um, but these guys they had hard times and they went through hard times to get to where they are. Jimmy Iovine didn't become a dock worker in the end though. He studied law, actually, he went on to study law, but he didn't really like that either. He wasn't a fan. It wasn't for him, but he always loved music. Like, I remember one of his family members explaining that he could literally make you love an artist and tell you everything about them, give you the full rundown on an artist that before he, you know, you might not even know. But he would, you know, reminds me of me a bit because literally when I get talking about music and music that I like, the other person ends up learning so much they would, ne- would never have even known about that artist. Now you get me talking about Pink Floyd, you get me talking about certain artists, I know more than the average stuff, it's weird. And in Jimmy's case, he loved the production side, the production of music, what was involved. He was really curious, so he went to lo- there's like a local rec- recording studio, initially he worked as a cleaner, then he got fired, then somehow, somehow, um, you know, he, he, he got that job back. You know, he was given another chance at his job, but eventually he got to know the recording engineers that were there and he like helped them and like was assisting them. And through that, he, he would like learn on the job, if you like, how to operate the recording equipment, you know. And he became an engineer from that, really, from learning from other people in the industry. And today, that's not something you see so much. You know, when you want to learn something, you have to, like, take a course and this and that. But not always. Sometimes you just learn from someone who's already experienced in that job. You see the way they do it and you you, you just, you know, you take it in, if you like. But when you're working as well and you're learning on the job, it makes a huge difference to, to the outcome, you know. But that that was nothing until one day it all changed. I mean... I don't know, just listen. Um, so they asked him to come in on Easter Sunday, right? And he's thinking, no, no, I can't go in, it's Easter Sunday. And then he said, eventually, he's like, screw it. I'm going to go into the recording studio. They need my help. Let's see what it is. So he goes there and he find, finds John Lennon and Yoko and I just sitting there like, can you help us with our recording this album, blah, blah, blah. John Lennon, guys. Do you understand? Like, so for him, that's like crazy. That's like nowadays meeting like, I don't know, who, who's top these days, Drake, you know? It's like meeting him and like get him needing your help to work on an album. I mean, come on, he, when you were a kid, he, he, was, he was a kid, and like, how he kept his head with John Lennon in the same room, I don't know. I don't know how he did, but I'm not comparing Drake to John Lennon, but, you know, for someone on that level to trust a kid to help them record music, it's, it's, n- it's not common. Um, and they got on as well as friends. Down to earth, you know, John Lennon obviously was. You see what I mean? Like, from from that. From that, he, he just went on and on. And literally, recording engineer was his, his job title for, for the years to follow. But either way, you know, hard work was the way that Jimmy had to go into this line of work. It wasn't an overnight thing. And you get to learn that recording, being a recording engineer is is stressful because you got the pressure of the artist on you as well. And maybe John Lennon didn't realise that so much. But after that, with other people he did. I mean, the problem is, these days, a lot of people don't feel worthy and are fearful of like, failure. They're like, no, I can never do that, you know. And that's the thing that really stops them progressing if they're scared of messing up. I mean, he could have been, but he couldn't afford to be. 
scared of that because once it happens, what could what could you what can you do? But that was it, make or break. And in Dr. Dre's case, DJing at his local club was the first proper like opportunity he got, and he took it. He was just focused, didn't care about anything else. You know, whatever he did, he just focused on that. He had this dream and he wanted to achieve it. That's that's not that's not um, straightforward always though. I mean, <laughs> there's a story of when he first went to the club with Easy E, Eric Wright, a, a good friend of his, former member of NWA as well. So yeah, Dre sweet talked his way in because he was a bit underage, and they weren't dressed to like for the for the club. He had to dress a certain way to get in, and he, he let Dre, Dre in. I mean, the, the bodyguard, whoever it was, the security, whoever. They let Dre in, but they didn't let Easy in just to piss him off, because he was so rude. Because <laughs> he did, he was compared to Dre, like Easy was a bit more rough and rough around the edges, you know, ready to fight at any moment. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Dre took that opportunity and focused solely on making the most of it to work with this group, and he was like, again, like they were legends for him, but as a young man, he was aiming to do what he loved and nothing more. You know, it's not easy for many people to do, do the same, you know. A lot of people try and fail, and then they never actually find out what their actual dream is in life. And they go a long time without feeling fulfilled, without knowing what actually can fill that gap, you know. Make them feel accomplished. Some people never find it, but you know, if you, you don't try, you never know. And again, like with Jimmy, Dre was not not afraid of the mistakes. He you know, he, he could make he could make a mistake, but he was only motivated by this pursuit pursue it constant pursuing a, of this dream, you know. The pursuit of this dream. If I can get the right words in. And moving back to Jimmy Iovine. Okay, he'd become a recording engineer. That was done. And then one day he got to work with John Lennon, and yeah, from then on, you know, he worked with so many artists. Then he he worked on Born to Run with Bruce Springsteen, and that was a time that he really worked hard and it was relentless. And Bruce was very demanding, but it was demanding of greatness, and that was a great album. You know, when you're paving the way, doing something different, and there's nothing else to go by, you just got to keep going. Hard work again. I mean, Jimmy was at breaking point at this point, and they said, you know, he realised that his, be his best interest, it was in his best interest to help Bruce, you know, because if he got this album right, then he got a lot of recognition too, and it would be a turning point, and it would really prove, like, the talent he had, like, for relentless work. And then, then began working as a producer, Obviously, with the record recording engineer experience behind him, this was easy really. But he produced for Patti Smith um, a song for Patti Smith called "Because the Night," which was number, which was like a top ten, it was like a top ten uh, album single. Sorry, um, but Bruce had wrote this, and Bruce didn't want to use the song, so Jimmy took the song to to Patti Smith and. She used it and top ten single. Do you understand? Because of Jimmy persuading her every day, saying, "Come on, um, read, read the, read the uh, the lyrics. Have a look at this song. Uh, you're gonna love it." Blah blah blah. He knew. It's like he knew. He had a clarity of vision to to realize the success or the potential this song had. Amazing. I mean, I can't believe I can't believe that. Though. I'm I'm watching it and I'm in shock that he's helped all these people and of course there's more to come um, but yeah moving back to Dre um, some years passed you know eventually wait hold on yeah yeah eventually yeah he did leave NWA eventually after the success they had you know and, but then he started Aftermath Records 
And for Dre, that was the turning point as well. Because Aftermath is like... He, he, you know, the thing that, that really kicked it off for him. You know, his career, his production career. So, yeah, I mean, he... Because he also... He was still with, with Easy e at this time, and like, he helped him do some solo songs. He helped Easy e who, like, he really taught him how to rap properly. Because at first he couldn't get it, and then, thanks to Dre, he got the improve, you know. Uh, then Ice Cube, uh, known as O'Shea Jackson, like his real name, O'Shea Jackson, which I didn't know before this. And some other people joined. Oh, sorry, when he, I mean, I, I meant he left Wildcast Wrecking Crew. This is when he was joining, starting NWA, if I can get it right. So it left, left um, Wildcast Wrecking Crew, had some success with them. So then him and Easy started recording together. Like like I've been saying, you know, he taught him the way. Um, then Ice Cube as well, and some other people like the DOC, a few other artists. And this was the beginning of NWA. Not everyone or anything is ever perfect. And this proves that and what followed proves that as well. And, you know, difficult situations serve us all as a lesson. And they serve Dre very well for the future. Um I mean no matter who you are, how talented you are, some things just can't prevent, like bad luck, you know. It happens to the best of us. And moving on to Jimmy. Um, Tom Petty was the next the next artist he would work with um, I'm a big Tom Petty, Tom Petty fan so this was amazing as well to, to hear this because I, I didn't even know this before you know, and he also became good friends with Jimmy and had a lot of success because of Jimmy's hard work and good ear for music you know, and the perseverance but what was interesting is that at the same time he was becoming romantically involved with Stevie Nicks, the singer from Fleetwood Mac, and she and him were dating, but they didn't want to tell anyone, but um, she recently left Fleetwood Mac, and Jimmy was helping her produce too, produce like a song for her. And the same song he was producing was a song that he took from Tom Petty that Tom Petty didn't want to use, but then this caused a bit of, caused a bit of you know, problems between uh, Jimmy and Tom, kind of, because it was his song. It wasn't like with the, you know, with Patti Smith and Bruce Springsteen. It was, it didn't go so well, basically. And why would it, if you took someone's song? But he didn't want to use it, so. So the song that Jimmy gave to Stevie Nicks was called Stop Dragging My Heart Around um, but his idea was that they would sing it together um, you know he had this wonderful like vision of what, what could be with these artists um, but of course it didn't go so well because Tom didn't take kindly to Jimmy taking the song again though this comes down to with both of them it's a great ear for music and being able to teach others in some ways I mean they were both music fans from a young age unless you are a fan of something you can't really have a true passion and be willing to work in it like any football player for example they're football fans way before they're football players from when they're kids you know that's what makes them want to be football players or you know, like me with with, uh, with music, I, I'm a huge fan. I, I could never sing, that's for sure. But the more I was seeing this, the more I was thinking like, okay, music production, one day, maybe, maybe. I mean, I'm good at the production of videos. And how far off is that? Do you know what I mean? Um, you can't act, you can't succeed in something if you don't have a passion for it. Otherwise, you know, if you don't, like, what, you just, without a soul or without a heart, you know, how can you do that? Anyway, moving back to NWA and Dre and 
the band was going well but they got in a bit of trouble over the years and they would be in trouble with the police from time to time you know uh, there was one time they were they had paintball guns and they were on the motorway shooting them and they got nicked for that of course police didn't take too kindly for that you know um, in that era there was a lot of police brutality there still is towards African Americans and they suffered that you know Ice Cube um, well he, not him personally but more Dre as well when he was younger and Eazy uh, but Ice Cube wrote the song F the Police the famous NWA song if you've seen the film straight out of Compton you you know the story of course and yeah it went on to be one of their most famous songs quite politically charged of course with the sw- behind all the swearing and that you know, there was a message about what the police, how the police were treating people uh, it had a political impact they all said that I mean because of that era in Los Angeles and where the police were you know I mean it may have caused more violence though like between youths and the police you know it may have, may, might have advocated some violence and charged like political a political discussion really the police did and still do mistreat people um, I'm not going to say because they're race but at the time yeah but people do get mistreated by the police I'm trying to keep it neutral here right again getting, getting this video demonetized but yeah the song however might not have been the best way to stop violence like the police anyway but, um, it might have caused more people fighting and standing up to the police some of them just doing their job not many but some of them <laughs> you know I'm all for anti-establishment you know the system's messed up screw the system blah 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 you know um, so the song when I hear it today I like laugh at it because it's quite funny really uh, and the way that, the way they sing it as well is quite but it was a serious message in there and it's about you know speaking the truth speaking your mind you know under all that swearing under all that effing and blinding I mean NWA had a lot of success with Dre and it was thanks to Dre as well he brought them all together um, but then a bit of a, a difficult time in Dre's life when it, his younger brother was in a fight and was unconscious he didn't regain consci- consciousness so his younger brother died so he didn't take that well and he took to drinking and the loss like made him more what's the word like he was more quiet you know but he carried on working hard which is surprising you know despite that adversity and difficult time in his life he was more to himself really he always had been from a young age but this just you know obviously obviously you understand you know losing a loved one for anyone doesn't matter how famous you are it can happen and it does and as successful as these guys are you know they're, they're all still human be- beings and reality can't escape any of us or them you see it all the time with these artists they think they're invincible they think everyone around them is and of course this you know this isn't true but the adversity that only makes them stronger and better people it makes us all better people you know like I said you learn from difficult situations you know more than you do from positive ones they take you further um, like if like in sports for example if you win yeah you won and you learn how to win but when you lose you learn what you've done wrong and what to do better next time you know don't don't live with it as regret use it as a teacher as a way to teach you how to learn from that and not lose next time so it's the same with, with difficult things in life they make you stronger and through that you can help other people go through the same thing anyway back to Jimmy eventually he and Stevie Nicks didn't work out they went their separate ways after the song was done that is um, uh, but then he met his ex-wife Vicky McCarty is that how you say it? There's no, there's, no, there's no TH it's just yeah it's not McCarthy okay it's me trying to read my notes but yeah um, and as a documentary it's just there's so much going on it's hard to take it in on both sides it's just especially the Jimmy side of it because it's the rock 
because I'm a fan of rock before hip hop. Fan of both, but it's like different worlds, slightly different eras, but um, amazing. And the next artist for Jimmy was U2 and Bono and the rest of the band, and they became great friends and they worked hard together. And that was another time where Jimmy always struggled because you know, there's so much work to do, a lot of pressure as well. But again, they got through it. Um, you know, they place him, they praise Jimmy for, you know, his clear thoughts, his clear mind, you know, always seeing the bigger picture. And you too, of course, we know the success. That's just amazing that he worked with them on music as well. So me and my dad were seeing that bit, we're like, oh my God, I can't believe this, where's this guy been? Like, I knew of Interscope, but didn't know of Jimmy Iovine himself. He's a fellow Italian, so can't go wrong there, can you? In Dre's case, though, in the band, within the band, things started going south, and there was a bit of a ruckus, if you like, arguments, you know. Ice Cube, Ice Cube left the group, and, you know, a few people fell out, and then Dre even fell out with Eazy-E, too, over the whole thing, and this led to, to Dre leaving the band. And it was a low point in his life again. Alcohol was present. And, you know, another difficult time. And at one stage, uh, he actually physically abused a journalist because she, she'd aired an interview with Ice Cube, bad mouthing Dre. Of course, he, you know, in the documentary, he's saying how sorry he is and he regrets it. Of course, he does. He was young and dumb, you know. We've all been there. Well, we some of us are still there. <laughs> Not me. I hope. I don't know. Um, yeah, and moving back to Jimmy, it was also a difficult time. He lost his granddad and then his dad the following day. And that much loss just dis destroys anyone. Um, and it, it bothered him for a while. For, you know, it was an impossible thing th to happen. No two loved ones at the same time within 24 hours but this only made him dive into the work as well which you wouldn't expect but he, he really worked hard he did a lot of charity work around Christmas because his father loved Christmas so he thought he would do a lot of charity work in memory of him and that kind of helped but yeah he wasn't the same after that and this is not always the best way to do his dress you know to work hard sometimes you need a break that's it. But despite this, he worked with you too. Continued to, you know. Despite all what was going on in his own life. Very intense. You know, and all the stress of the music industry as well. He did it nonetheless, and he was a business man, you know. A very good one, and when you stop working, that's not good for business. I mean, both of them, they went through so much difficult times that easily could have broken the average person but it didn't in their case you know there's nothing wrong with like feeling broken and down and like you got all this bad luck nothing going your way but they're not be not be to not be willing to fight back and fight despite that is not okay you know if you just say fine I want to stay at this low point and I'm not going to do anything that doesn't get you anywhere. To be willing to get back up, like, you've been knocked down in the boxing ring, you know, get back up. We've all seen Rocky. Well, most of us. You know, boxing, you see it. Play, boxers get knocked down, they get up again. Keep getting up. <laughs> Tyson Fury, more recently. Just kept getting up. Just kept getting hit. Kept going. Cycle of life. And this proved it for both of them. Um... Then next for Dre came Snoop Dogg. He discovered him. Well, not really. His cousin Warren G gave him a tape, which Snoop Dogg, known as Calvin Bordis, um, you know, he was rapping on this tape, and it's just amazing. And Dre knew straight away he had an, another talent. He knew. I mean, Snoop Dogg is just a cool dude, isn't he? Really. As a kid, I was a huge fan. Just that 
laid back attitude. Because as a kid, I didn't know what he was smoking. I, I, I didn't know that side of it as a kid. You're just like, well, this guy's so cool. Why? What's he got that I haven't? Loads and loads of marijuana, basically. Nothing else to it. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Still made great music. So yeah, he knew he had a talent. And we know how good Snoop Dogg is, his voice is quite unique. You know, um, but Dre already had his reputation, and Snoop knew this, Snoop was just from the, the kid from the streets, you know. He was just grateful to be in the same room as Dre. You know, um, just in awe of it, of, well, not in awe, but you know what I mean, like, this guy was a legend around there, in, in, in LA. So the reputation, you know, he trusted Dre. And of course he was always smoking too many drugs. <laughs> that was Snoop. Snoop D-O double G. And now, for Jimmy, the birth of, Int of Interscope was an interesting time, you know. And what Interscope did after, the, like, the success they had was just beyond belief, you know. More than just a production company, more than just, you know, producers. So Jimmy seeked advice from David Geffen. David Geffen is another producer who's got, you know, the guy behind Geffen Productions, you know, record production, Ge Geffen Records, whatever it's called. Anyway, Jimmy, you know, seeked his advice and he took on all the information he could and because he wanted to start this label hence Interscope was born I'm not going to get into all the details but you know they were in partnership with a lot of big labels such as Atlantic Records I mean that's an amazing achievement to begin with to get it you know because Jimmy knew a lot of people by this point he'd already built up his reputation worked with many artists he was a bit older a bit wiser that ear for music and even these guys believed in him it seems other production companies you know um, and we move on a few years um, a big signing for them was no doubt Gwen Stefani was part of this band she was just a kid you know he said to her six years from now you're gonna be a success you're gonna be famous you know and she didn't believe him she's like okay whatever you say Jimmy, who I've never met before, uh, she was like some random guy. Just told her this, and when you tell someone that, they believe. Of course, they're not going to believe it, but a part of them makes them think like, "Okay, I've got to prove it then. What I've got to do to get there? I've got to go through a lot as a person to be this artist. Six years from now, you know." And he helped her within no doubt the whole group, and in you know, her solo career a lot. Um, then the next big thing was Nine Inch Nails, a rock band. Um, there was a lot of politics around this. I mean, they weren't happy with their current label and they wanted to leave. But any other label taken over would have had to go through the lawsuit of like getting rid of the other label. If you know what I mean, it it w would have been a lot of legal stuff because that's how it is with this sort of thing. You know. Um, by this point, he realised that he needed producers that he could train to produce for him, if you know what I mean. Producers of producers, basically. He's a producer of producers. You know. Um, you've got to delegate at some point. I mean, he worked hard to sign Nine Inch Nails. He would be on the phone every day with the legal people involved. The other label, the head of the other label was very stubborn. Um, you know, but he gave him the bigger picture, made him see that it was better if he stepped down, you know, stepped aside. Because um, he knew that one inch nails were good, nine inch nails, sorry. Um, you know, the, group, the group no wanted, no longer wanted to be part of this label they were part of originally. You know, I mean, Jimmy would speak to people involved trying to sign the group every day, you know. He had this power of persuasion, this way of stepping into people's shoes, like t seeing it from their point of view, putting himself in their shoes and then 
seeing what they would want and what would be best for them, then using that in his argument, you know, it's uncanny the way you, you would you could you could do that, you know. He had the marketing ploy, if you like. It was his strength, you know, and he could he could get for any sort of debate like this, any sort of situation like this, because he could understand their motivations when putting himself in their shoes, you know. Interscope at the time wasn't very big though, so this was a money maker, you know. There was a lot of risk involved, but Jimmy had learned to deal with fear throughout his life, working with artists that were big, you know, the pressure. He could deal with it, he'd been been through it before, many times, there was nothing new to him. But Jimmy had nine nine inch nails who who signed uh who got Marilyn Manson on board. Crazy guy. But then again, sales is what, what Jimmy's after. Doesn't care what they're trying to represent, really. Not doesn't care, but like doesn't matter how controversial they are. If they sell records, they sell records. From a business standpoint that's the right thing to do. Yeah, it can be a bit reckless some of these artists. You know, the way the journalists portray them. Like, you know, similar things happen with Eminem in the future but we'll get onto that later you know because of the things he rapped about good old M but yeah moving back to Dre's story um, it wasn't an, an easy time to be in, in in Compton in the 90s you know there was a lot of crime Make, during the time he was making his first album The Chronic um, you know it's difficult difficult to get signed He'd be giving out his CDs everywhere, and he, he did lose a bit of faith. Like nobody really gave him a chance, you know. We've all been there, like when you just don't believe in yourself anymore. For Dre, that you know, that was he'd been through difficult times, but you know, he really wanted to help make this album do well. You know, he needed help. He couldn't do it on his own, but it was just the big labels were. They'd seen what was going on in Compton. They were scared of these of these rap artists, you know, these hip hop artists. What they how they would react, how they would be to be around to deal with. But of course, Jimmy didn't have that problem. You know, he did have that problem, but he went through it anyway. You know, so Dre had a lot of difficulties in this in this sense because nobody trusted these rap artists. All these lawyers, all these big producers were a bit scared. But not Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy wasn't. Um, you know. Then this was the point when the paths crossed. You know, Jimmy found out about Dre um, and Suge Knight. Suge Knight was the guy behind Death Row Records, who Dre was signed to at the time. Um, you know, he met with both of them. You know, and it, you know, he admits it was a bit like, "Well, what's going on here?" Um, you know, Jimmy met with them. They played the Chronic, and he knew straight away. You know, you, you know Jimmy. He had that ear. Um, he developed that ear for music, and Jimmy realised that it was exactly what Interscope needed to get off the ground. He he knew straight away um, the sounds and the beats that Drake could create. Just unique. And. If you listen to a Dre song, you know straight away. You, you know you can tell which song's a Dre song. You can tell he made the beat in some way. You know, so many artists he did he did work for too. But Jimmy was willing to help them clear the lawsuits that they had, like Suge and Dre that had lawsuits. I don't know what for exactly, but there was a lot of things that were going on that time. Um, this is before Suge Knight. You know, would be accused of many, many, many things like the death of Tupac and other things like that, and or Biggie or vice versa. Um, you know, the involvement in that, and of course, we know him for the hit and run he did. That's more, well, that's quite a while ago, but yeah, that was like 2000 or something around that time when he he, he did a hit and run and he killed someone, went to prison for that as well. But this was before all that, you know, he was just a the boss of Death Row at this time. Lovely name for a label, by the way, Death Row Records. Lovely name, you know. <laughs> no innuendos there. And eventually, the, 
Dre got on the front of Rolling Stone magazine with, with Snoop as well. You know, they didn't expect that. That was something new to them. Um, you know, it was great success. Uh, it came quick, which was great for Interscope, you know. And Jimmy really became fr tight friends with Suge Knight and took him under his wing. Help helped him as a producer. You know, they were good friends. But Jimmy, of course, he wasn't well versed in all the hip hop rap culture, all the politics that came with it. East v West, West v East, New York, LA, you know, East Coast, West Coast. I mean, Dre went on to help, help Snoop release his first album, Doggy Star, I think it's called. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he helped him with that, and that was a great success. Just people loved Snoop, you know. Um, all this success, and then going back to the fact that, you know, Jimmy didn't know this rap hip hop culture, all the, the gang stuff involved, the gangs, the bloods, the crips. Um, it all came to the fore when Snoop's bodyguard shot and killed a kid who was claiming self-defence. I mean, Snoop was claiming self-defence on this, but this kid was from a rival gang, they believe, you know, it was gang-related. Um, so he was in court for that, so that kind of put a halt on that for a bit, but Snoop had a lot of success, and so did Dre. Um, till Dre got caught speeding in his Ferrari, his Testarossa, his white Testarossa, as he called it. Testarossa, I don't know. That's how they say it in America. They can't pronounce anything right. <laughs> no offence, Testarossa, if, if we're talking about Italian here. But yeah, so Dre turned himself in for that, he went to prison for a bit, five months in the end. Just one of those moment low points in his life again I mean if I had a Ferrari to be honest I would have done the same thing wouldn't you like you got this fast car use it what are you waiting for <laughs> you only live once you know to be in a wild police car chase in a Ferrari is some people's dream you've all seen the movies you know Everyone wants to be in the car chase, everyone, but obviously it's not going to end like in the movies, is it? You're normally not the hero if you're in a car chase with police. <laughs> you're normally the guy that's trying to shoot, you know. And we move back to the story of Dre, though, and Tupac was also signed to the label. You know, obviously he was signed to Death Row. Death Row was part of Interscope at the time. You know, and we know the power with which Tupac could speak, could sing. What he stood up for, he stood up for truth, you know, for what was right. He got in trouble himself with the law a few times. Unfortunate in some cases more than another. Shot many times. Recovered, like the first time. Of course, and, you know, he was, a, he was an, an emotional guy. And if you rubbed him the wrong way, you know, he would react. Deep down, he was a good person, you know. And to this day in the industry, they still talk about him like he is a god, you know, like 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 notorious B.I.G. as well. Both of them like taken too young. Um, and yeah, of course, they didn't know what, what was to come in the future. Um, so here, the, really, the stories are like combining. Like it's when Jimmy met Dre, when it all started, you know, the crossing paths. But going back to Jimmy. Um, you know, with Marilyn Manson when they signed him, the media didn't like him. And nobody, did. you know, the guy was a bloody Satanist, was satanic, and that doesn't bode well for a lot of people, a lot of religious people. You know, he's a nutter. Uh, he's a bit of a scary guy to be honest. But he sold label, he sold records. I mean, the government thought Interscope was to blame, be it with Snoop. Tupac and Dre, or Death Row Records, or Marilyn Manson, you know, they thought like, we're spreading the wrong message, censorship, you know, we all know about censorship today, just kills everything, basically, and the media were like going mad, like, 
to this point that to the point that uh, Time Warner, namely Michael Fuchs, who was like a was like investigating this, um, was beginning an attempt at cleaning house you know, to get rid of these artists, some of these producers that were causing problems in the, in the media, you know, that were against people's like opinion, you know, against. Well, people within the, the like the execs, you know, the executives, they wanted to clean house by buying out Interscope, you know, but Jimmy had other ideas. Jimmy was going to fight for it, you know, he wasn't going to say, you know, there you go, was he? So this Michael Fuchs guy went behind Jimmy's back, tried to meet with who else but Suge Knight, but Jimmy and Suge Knight spoke before this and came up with a plan and. They found a way to skip the meeting, like, they just went and sat in some normal, like, restaurant somewhere, and just waited there till the other guy gave up. The guy would keep fighting, this Michael Fuchs guy, um, would keep phoning Sugar and be like, yeah, I'll be there in a minute, you know, and he never turned up. Because <laughs> Jimmy knew it would m would have meant a loss of control of his, his baby in Interscope, the thing he worked so hard to achieve, you know. You didn't want that ripped away. Why would you? Uh, that was where the success was. And then back to Dre and to about 1995, he was hit hard by the death of Easy, e his former best friend and colleague in NWA. I mean, he wasn't talking with him or Ice Cube at this time, but of course, when things like this come come up, you forget your beef and swallow your pride, you know, because it's more important things than how you feel about something, you know what I mean? Your emotions, you know. So Ice Cube called Dre and told him they hadn't spoken since the, the breakup, you know, of the band. <laughs> so yeah, um, and Ice Cube told him the news, despite not speaking for years, you know, they put their past issues behind them, you know, and Dre was there for Easy E, you know, on his deathbed, literally, like, last time he saw him, he was not in good shape. They made peace, you know, he, of course, why, why wouldn't you? Um, and that was the last time we saw Easy E. Uh, and that was a sh another sad time for him. Again, like, like, when he lost his brother, it was like losing another brother, really, for him. I mean, the, the past is the past. It shouldn't affect your future negatively, and, you know, it's too short to, to waste on beef and feuds and stuff. Sometimes there's more important things than that, you know, when it comes to friends. You know, you've got to swallow your pride sometimes. Forget it, you know, because there are still friends, clearly. Even though I hadn't spoken for years. You know, then came... Then this is really when the East Coast, West Coast beef started, you know. It was Death Row Records and LA against Bad Boy Productions, you know, Puffy, um, in New York, and, and, and Notorious B.I.G., of course, in New York. So it's East v. West. Uh, well, it was a, they were beefing with Naz as well, another New York rapper, legend at that. You know, at, at first it wasn't that way, they were all in the same room, all these artists appreciating each other east and west, you know, and then kind of went south, started to go south, you know, just because of something, uh, I think Suge Knight said about about um, Puff Daddy the guy behind Bad Boy Records Bad Boy Productions so it was a bit of beef going on there you know, Jimmy found out Tupac was in prison um, following, well, was it following this? Yeah, it was, I can't remember what exactly Tupac got nicked for. It was either a woman who falsely accused him of, like, rape or something, or it was when he beat someone, I think he beat someone up, did he? No, that, that was in Vegas, sorry, that was later on, but anyway, yeah. So for some reason, yeah, Tupac was in prison, um, and everyone, everyone thinks that Death Row bailed him out, you know, but it was actually, the money came from Interscope from the top. From Jimmy and his guys, you know, they saw the genius of Tupac. They thought we better get him out of prison. Don't, think, don't, don't want this guy to write in prison, you know. 
you know. Um, you can't. And Jimmy knew the talent, you know. Tupac was a true genius. Even Dre knew this. Um, but like the violence in LA took its toll on Dre he had to get out you know you know he wanted out of death row because with the beefing that was going on but Jimmy said you know don't break up the band you know tried to persuade him you know this will affect your career negatively if you leave at this point Dre had already made up his mind and he was taking this risk no matter what no matter what anyone said and he was doing what was best for him you know death row were getting more and more violent and aggressive and there were people being beaten up in their offices at, at some point some artists involved were mentioning like there was violence involved you know success might have gone to their heads a bit like bringing gang, gang violence into it when you mix things like that it's not good never good I mean J Jimmy felt like it was a lot of stress he didn't know if it was funding all the violence and chaos or funding free speech you know, and it's difficult because you've got you got at one point you've got to just realize what's actually going on there. We all know the Tupac story and around around the conspiracy of his murder and stuff. Um, and when Jimmy found out about this, he was distraught. Like a guy lost so young, you know. And Jimmy was worried for his own family and friends. It was a dangerous time, you know, because of death row records and the beefs involved. But the beef between East and West, it only grew, you know. Tupac was, well, you know, he was was a good person, great musician, but he could be emotional, you know. And this beef, you know, portrayed that and showed that. Um, we all know the story, you know, between the murder and wh whether it's gang related or not. You know, everyone was taken by shock, you know. It was like too young. So, someone so talented and such a good person really you know was the worst thing that could have happened and Jimmy himself you know you wish you could have prevented it everyone does you know because of the the circumstance you know nobody should be taken in that way you know I mean it's emotional for a lot of the people speaking about this you know Snoop um, was there at his bedside um, and he was saying how emotional it was for, for Tupac's mother as well, you know, of course. And he saw pa Tupac in that bed, you know. Um, later he's, he, he died and succumbed to the, the injuries, the bullet wounds and all that. But, you know, it was a sad time for a lot of the artists. And you see this in the, in, in the interviews and in the documentary, like their, their feelings towards it, you know. Hit everyone hard. It's a shock, I mean, to this day. People still talk about it, you know. In that, era, in that era of the 90s, there's a lot of loss. Like Kurt Cobain as well. Um, Ayrton Senna in Formula 1. The 90s was just full, full of like those sad stories that people that were taken too young. Um, but this was the point where Dre really um, worked on Aftermath Records. This was a few years later after the, the death of Tupac, you know, when he, he got out of, you know, Death Row was no more as well because Sugar had gone to prison. Um, Dre really wanted to grow Aftermath and this was a point where Jimmy stepped in and he helped him, you know. Um, and it was a 50-50 partnership, Aftermath, Interscope, then nothing, you know. It was just on from there. You know, as they say, the rest is history. Um, you know, the album didn't go... For Dre, at this point, the album didn't go too well. Two albums that Dre had did not go too well. And Jimmy kept the faith and said, if you're going to drop him, you can take my salary too. And I'm leaving too. You understand? Like, he trusted Dre. He knew he could do it. When Dre didn't, you know, it's a difficult time. And, you know, Dre might have been regretting what happened, you know, but Death Row was no more regardless, you know. Um, then the saving grace, the moment that changed it all, was when Jimmy um, had this, got this, given this tape from one of his interns who went to a, like a rap battle, and it was Eminem. Eminem was on this tape, Slim Shady, <laughs> and he listened to the tape, and 
Eminem, Marshall Mathers. It was the first time Dre heard him, you know, and he was like, who's this kid? Who is this? We need him now, you know? <laughs> and you, obviously you know, you know the story. <laughs> I mean, Dre was quick to sign Eminem that day, literally. First time they recorded the song. The first song was My Name Is, that famous Eminem song. And from the first day they hit it off, you know, the production um, of greatness was there. Like, Dre knew the talent of this kid and he put faith in him when nobody else would have. Trust, it's about trust in this industry and throughout this has been like taking a risk, but that the risk normally pays off. Not always, but at least you will have learned if it doesn't. But in this case, it really did. Uh, you know, Eminem the way he was and the execs, they wanted to dry out because of the failures of his previous albums. He wasn't doing too well after those albums, but um, Interscope and Aftermath went even bigger, you know. They kept growing because Eminem did so well. Dre was producing albums for 50 Cent, the game, and followed with more Eminem albums, you know, with his success. And they're just saying when, Dre was just saying when he met Eminem is this, this kid, this little kid, like, <laughs> in this bright yellow hoodie, like, you, you wouldn't have expected it. But he could relate to him because he was from, a kid from the streets too. Um, been, had a difficult upbringing in the same way. So there was a lot of things they could relate to there. Um, plus Interscope, find other artists, you know. Gwen Stefani had made it, Black Eyed Peas, um, he's the guy that, well, I mean, Jimmy is the guy that literally got Black Eyed Peas together, you know, he said to William, you need to sign Fergie, and then you need to sign, you need to get to other people, and you need to form, like, there needs to be four of you, you know, find artists, and he did, and obviously, you know, Black Eyed Peas, we know their success, Timberland, Pussycat Dolls, all these bands, groups, artists were part of Interscope, it's just amazing. I couldn't believe it, like, all these artists, oh my god. And then you begin to realise, okay, they were good, that's why they were good. The marketing behind it, you know. I mean... I can't believe it. <laughs> like, all the, all the success. Um, you know. I'm watching this, I, re I realised how talented Jimmy is. He saw the potential in people that maybe they themselves did not. It's difficult. Um, like, you know, it's like in in football when you're scouting players, you can see the passion and the talent from a young age. It doesn't always come through, but it's with experience. Like, and Jimmy had learnt, learnt himself the hard way. People trusted him when maybe he didn't, you know, from John Lennon back in the day, trusting him to Bruce Springsteen. But despite all the success, you wouldn't believe it, but Interscope were suffering. And guess what? There was piracy. It was the era of piracy and illegally downloading music and LimeWire, BearShare, you know, all those sites where you could stream music, like download music illegally. Um, and Jimmy, being the business mind that he is, he didn't want to lose out as a result of this. You know, it was a new era. A new era in music. You know, I mean, I remember as a kid, before iTunes, before, you know, I'd be using BearShare to download music illegally for my, my MP3 player. That's how old I am. <laughs> and I remember it like, it was yesterday, like, we were cheating the system. It was fun cheating the system. At the same time, everyone did it. And you'd have all these albums. <laughs> and Interscope was suffering though, because all their artists, you know, they weren't selling CDs. Nobody was buying CDs, they were buying knockoff CDs or pirated music or downloading it, you know. It was that, it was just chaos at that time. I, I mean, I was part of it too. And then when the iPod came out and iTunes changed the game, you know, and Jimmy wanted a piece of the action. Of course, he knew this was a way to carry on making money off the music, you know. Everyone wanted an iPod and everyone was using iTunes to get music. I mean, I didn't get an iPod straight away, I wasn't that lucky. 
Our parents had it was a bit were a bit stricter than the other. I don't know. Were they that strict? Yeah. I did. I, my, a lot. A few of my friends had iPad, iPods. The first iPod. I didn't get an iPod till a few years later, but I, I had. I think I had the iPod Nano when that came out. I still have my MP3 player with my legally downloaded music. Um, but yeah, that came out and I just monopolised the whole thing, the whole industry. And you know, nobody's looked back. Today you have Spotify, you have SoundCloud as well, but iTunes is still up there. Apple Music. I mean, we're talking about many years later. Jimmy and Dre are still good friends, and Jimmy brings this idea to Dre about, you know, merchandise. Um, Dre's like, no, I don't want to make sneakers or clothes. You know, I don't care. Um, but Jimmy said, what about headphones and speakers? <laughs> Dre Beats was born. I mean, Dre. And Jimmy wanted the, you know, the best of the best for headphones. I wanted to be not headphones you, you, you cancel out and cancel out noise to on the plane or a train. Music that literally is like a party in your ears. You know. So they went to Monster, they joined up with Monster to make headphones from scratch. Which is risky business because in the tech industry, if you're new to it, you're going to suffer because there's so many dominant companies, you know, Bose, they, I mean, they, they thought of Bose, I mean, Bose had, they're still great today, they, have, they had noise cancelling headphones, Dre wanted to do the opposite, and make like the best sound possible, and of course it was a marketing ploy, and Jimmy, you know, Jimmy had that side covered, his marketing prowess, we know, um, he made it his duty to get a photo of almost every artist, with the Beats headphones on, and it spread to every kind of corner of the globe, to every sport, you know. Um, you know, and it's product placement, literally. In half the music videos of his artists, in scope artists, they would have Beats. Um, but he needed help from Apple, because, like I said, he wanted in this whole iTunes thing, and that's what they did. Um, there was Beats music, you know. The Beats headphones were, they were culture, it was a cultural thing, it was like a fashion statement. Like I said, all the music videos, you know. You know, and at, at the same period, Interscope also signed Lady Gaga, who else, <laughs> similar to Gwen Stefani in the way she performs and, you know, on stage and stuff, and similar weirdness. <laughs> but yeah, and so there's a bit in the documentary, and she's like giving, giving out these headphones in an interview and stuff, like, oh, they're the best headphones, blah, blah, blah. They're in a video too, she's got them, the headphones on in her video. It's just marketing. Jimmy, once again, doing what he does best. I mean, next for, for Dre on the music front was who else but Kendrick Lamar, a fellow Compton, you know, Compton legend, if you like, today anyway. Oh, uh, Dre had a good ear and he you knew this kid would be good too. Um, and of course, Kendrick Lamar being from Compton as well. You know, for him, Dre was a god, was a legend. So he wouldn't turn down that chance. I mean, would you? Would you turn down that chance? No. Of course not. That's like me getting to work with what? I don't know, Casey Neistat. Yeah, right. <laughs> One day. When I go to New York, I'm going to find him, I don't care. <laughs> but, I mean, Kendrick Lamar was a kid when he first met Dre. And he said that Dre didn't know he met him, but Kendrick knew he met Dre. It was on the music video for Tupac's California Love that Dre was producing. This was 15 years ago. And 15 years later, Dre and Kendrick are in the studio. And from Kendrick's point of view, it's just amazing to come full circle. I mean, there was the guy that made him the fan of rap that he was, and hip hop, and the artist that he was, probably. You know, when two guys come from the same place, they have the same vision, and they see the same goal, you know. So they're working together, it's just simple, isn't it? You know, Jimmy and Dre, they both came from nothing, and look how far they got, and they're still going. I mean, 
This documentary ends with a lot of quality advice. All these artists and producers that were involved in the interviews throughout this whole documentary, you know. Um, you know, and it's really my summary of what some of them said, you know, these people that have made it, these artists. You know, all these artists that believed and they had their dreams and they achieved them. You know, uh, it's all you've got to do in life. You got got to focus on that, like one, be one dimensional in that sense. Be open to new things, you know. Anyway, what they said was like, you know, you need to be true to your art, no matter what people say or if they judge you or whatever, and yourself, you know, true to yourself. Don't worry about what anyone anyone else thinks, you know. You got to be determined, be willing to work. And one of them kept saying, "Stay in the saddle," you know. Shut is emphasizing that. Um, but you got to have a determination. You know, this is how you do what has never been done before. You be determined when nobody else believes in you or gives you any credit or says, yeah, you can do it. And the documentary ends there. And it's just amazing. Uh, amazing, really. Um, I recommend you watch it. It's like four episodes, I think, covering all this in more detail. Um, no, I really enjoyed watching it and I just had to tell you guys about it because it's inspirational for me and it should be for you in some way. Um, and since I've been making these podcasts, I've really enjoyed it, like giving my take on things. Um, and especially in the first one or two, when I was really talking about how I got to where I was, it's quite emotional, like, did I really go through all that? That negative stuff, that, those difficult times, those doubts, you know, they, these guys have been there um, and this motivates me just like you've got to believe in yourself whatever you're doing you got to stay true to yourself you know don't try and mimic anyone else copy anyone else and this documentary proved that and how hard these guys worked and stuff about Dre I knew I knew the talent the artist he worked with Interscope I knew about them but I didn't know Jimmy this guy Jimmy Iovine was at the centre of it and the guy behind it and especially the stuff with with the artist he worked with I can't believe I still can't believe it and yeah if you think of Dre all the artists he's produced have gone on to great things Kendrick I've seen live and I've seen the, the, the talent and the how down to earth he can be when you've come from from nothing you know and I relate to this because um, my dad's from the south of Italy you know, a small town everyone was hard working his dad was a farmer you know he just worked for a better life for his family and you know he didn't want my dad to be a farmer as well he wanted him to have something more to achieve more and yeah being a hairdresser was a step up you know and he and my dad worked at that and for years you know you, you work at something until you you get it right then it pays off experience you know counts for a lot in any business do you know what I mean so I've come from, from well my family come from humble beginnings like these guys so those kind of people I think they make it further most of the time if you believe in yourself that is if you just focus on getting to your dreams working hard you know you might not always be doing what you love but you'll be working towards it hopefully and if you try and fail, at least you tried. It's better than not trying at all. Then you'll never know. Um, and I, I really want to emphasise the fact that you should just watch this documentary. I'm not. It's not an advert for Netflix or anything. The defiant ones. It is limited. Out for limited time. I really am marketing this, aren't I? I'm doing a Jimmy. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. This is podcast 12. It's been a joy. It's been a pleasure. Um, good morning, good evening, good night. Thank you for joining me from wherever you are in the world. North, south, east, west. And remember, the earth is round. It's not flat. <laughs> um, happy Easter, happy holidays to all of you. This has been your host, Louisie21. And yeah, just don't give up.
be a defiant one. I know you can. Just have faith. I will see you guys very soon. Take care, whatever you're doing. Give it 100%. You know, work towards your dreams every single day. Don't stop. Don't stop. Literally. Keep working at it every day. Every single day. And I'm Luisi21 and I will see you soon. Take it easy fam. Peace. Alright, see you later guys. Ciao for now. I haven't said that for years. Oh my. Cringe. I'm saying I come back stronger. You know, I'm not talking ignorant. You know what I'm saying?